postdoctoral research, research fellow on the project Knowing the Secret Police, Secrecy and Knowledge and in East German Society. And I'll be chairing today's webinar on surveillance in relation to secrecy, privacy and knowledge. Like in the last um, two webinars, um, the relationship and tension between revelation, concealment will be an overarching theme today. There is, however, a shift in focus, as the papers today are dealing more explicitly with the phenomenon of surveillance and its impact on secrecy, privacy and knowledge. So our first speaker today is Annie Ring. Annie Ring is an associate um, professor of German and film at UCL. Um, she has widely published on, um, on um, the Stasi uh, theories on surveillance and the archive, and um, including her monograph after the Stasi, now in second edition, 2017. And she has also contributed as a co-editor to the volume Architecture and Control. And, um, and due to be published in October is um, her BFI Film Classics volume, The Lives of Others. And uh, it was forthcoming um, this fall, as I just said. Um, Annie Ring will be talking about um, well, the paper title is How to Disappear, Short Films on Escaping Surveillance After the Internet. Um, she will address the way um, contemporary short films are trying to escape digital surveillance, but struggling to find a space of privacy. So we look forward to hearing your paper, Annie. So 15 minutes and... Um, well, I'll give you a sign somehow. Probably we'll do it like last in the last webinar. Maybe I just um, switch off my screen. And when there are two minutes left, I like the idea. I'll just switch my screen on again, if that's OK. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you for the wonderful invitation. I'm really, really happy to be able to contribute to this wonderful webinar series. And it's great to see all of you, see some of you again. Uh, Vita and Carol Ann and Betiel, and to see some of you whose work I'm aware of um, and haven't yet had the pleasure of meeting. Um, yeah, so without further ado, here is my PowerPoint. And let me know if you can't see it. Okay. We live in a time when the large scale use of the internet by people all around the world allows vast archives of data to be routinely captured and analyzed. The results of this data mining are mobilized to generate profit and influence through techniques as dangerous and as divisive as racialized profiling and personalized political propaganda. And yet it seems difficult for technology users to take the knowledge we have about these abuses and then make decisions that create more privacy, more secrecy even, in our technologically networked lives. The 2013 revelations by Edward Snowden and Sarah Harrison about the espionage, espionage system of the US National Security Agency and its partners worldwide didn't cause any noticeable shifts or reductions in technology use. Thereafter, many technology users were scandalized when it emerged in 2016 that Cambridge Analytica, a data trading consultancy connected with Brexit and the Donald Trump campaigns had covertly harvested user data from Facebook online activity. But again, knowledge about that kind of data mining for political manipulation didn't suffice to cause any mass exoduses from the social media platform. This might be partly because those kind of scandals don't always influence many technology users. There's a significant mass of people who either remain unaware of the surveillance or don't really mind it because they feel they have nothing to hide. Meanwhile, many more informed technology users stay on social media for a variety of really understandable reasons. Therefore, my claim today is that there is something inherently problematic about the fantasy of a sovereign gesture of disconnection from surveillance in the age of the internet. There are multiple obstacles to disconnection, and these are compounded by the attractive aesthetic and psychological registers that new media designs and online data mining platforms use to hook users into habitual complicities. And this becomes clear when we look at the examples of short film and video by German speaking directors and Peter Steyer, and a director collective made up of Leonhard Müller, 
Mona, Robin Klengel and Michael Stumpf that I'll talk about now briefly. We see conscious, playful attempts at asserting privacy and secrecy even in Hito Stiles' gallery installation, How Not To Be Seen. How Not To Be Seen is a short film made up of real and CGI footage or live action and CGI footage accompanied by Stiles' own theoretical voices and filming. As its subtitle tells us, Hito Stiles' film is a fucking didactic educational.mov file and it purports to train viewers in eluding visual surveillance. Stiles describes the film's genesis from her question, can I be invisible to surveillance? And she borrowed the title from a Monty Python sketch of 1970 of the same name, which purported to be government advice on how to disappear and was a comic film, of course. And appropriately given that nod to Monty Python, the piece provides a comic training in invisibility for the subject wanting to withdraw from being under surveillance. And the piece therefore produces a didactic narrative structured around playful performances of trying to withdraw. The viewer of the short piece learns tongue in cheek makeup disguises, which confuse machine learning systems and prevent them from recognizing a face as a face. The modes of disguise shown in the sequence are extremely tactile with style rubbing her face. And at the same time, what she rubs onto her face is CGI patterns. So we have two physical and digital realities coexisting in the film, Stiles' face becoming disguised by, both by the really physical rubbing action and by that confusing digital patterning. Of course, the film doesn't show us how to be invisible. Instead, it uses comic understatement to thematize the impossibility of invisibility in the era after the digital revolution. And there's an extremely playful tone then as Stiles takes us away from the problem of how not to be seen to a more broad ranging analysis of how images are made in this era and in turn, how those images make the world around us. In an interview in 2015, she quoted Wilhelm Flusser who claims that since 1989, images can be said to make the world. And he gave the example of the Romanian revolution in which TV images incited people to do certain things or not do certain things. So news images didn't so much as record, but in fact catalyze events in the historical world. The world making images that Steyr is looking at in this piece are surveillance images, particularly related to the aerial photography by which satellite surveillance takes place, an especially important kind of photography in the era of global warfare guided by smart technology. Indeed, the film engages with technological as well as ethical questions of surface in the function of surveillance. And some of the real footage or live action footage the film shows are of these resolution charts used in military photography to calibrate aerial images in the last days of analog. And she then shows us the new pixel based resolution charts that came into use after the onset of digital photography. We then see this wonderful dance in which figures, live action figures with fabric boxes on their heads are choreographed emerging from the pixel based chart, dancing into increasingly differentiated patterns. This, is, this dance lampoons the power that's held by new techniques of ever more thorough surveillance, or it tries to. Because the tone here is playful, but also extremely serious. And part of the installation's power lies in what it goes on to say about the high visibility of certain subjects who are racialized and experience a higher distribution of surveillance and attendant violence than other white people do, basically. In lesson four, how to be invisible by disappearing, the film guides us through an eerily perfect CGI landscape inhibited by pale white silhouettes. Shile argues in the film that white is without color, it is the default, and then superimposed onto the CGI image, our image are shots of actors playing androgynous figures in burka-like garments who are bent down in awkward submissive positions. These postures invoke the imagery of the war on terror. But also within the logic of this film- Apologies, Annie, um, your slides are not moving for some reason. I thought it was just an issue I've had. Uh, it seems that we are not seeing, I mean, we are still on the first slide. Oh, I, I see. I don't think this was on purpose, was it? No, not working, huh? I'll just pause it and try starting again where I'm at. Yeah, it's frustrating okay. to be able to see them. I'm sorry, yeah, it's okay. No problem, it's good that you stopped me. Let's try play from current slide. What can you see now? That looks better. Mm. Let's hope it keeps moving then. <laughs> Does that then move on to the next one? Yes, please. Yeah. It's just stayed on that one, huh? I'm going to 
quit the slideshow and just see if it it's if I... yeah Annie, it's not a slideshow we are seeing we are seeing the the normal computer screen not the oh, show. that's the reason okay that's interesting share screen powerpoint can you see the images then Can you click on the next slide, maybe, so we can see where that's moving? Maybe if you clicked on slide nine. Uh -huh. I've done that. Is it showing? No. Uh -huh. How frustrating. I think I might end slideshow and see if you can see it better just with the slides kind of in editing mode. Now it's on slide. Now it was. Uh -huh. oh, yeah. OK. Can you see my slideshow there in editing mode? Yes, no, that's good. Great. So, so the submissive postures of the actors invoke the imagery of the war on terror, but also within the logic of the piece, they suggest ambivalence about the possibility of escaping surveillance. The Steyl has said in an interview about the film, not being seen can also be deadly. And the film theorizes what it means to be invisible and the conditions under which invisibility is possible after the digital revolution, but also the conditions in which that invisibility can be annihilation. And the words um, of the voiceover state, in the decades of the digital revolution, 170,000 people disappear. So the film questions the desirability, in fact, of going unseen, reminding us that being able to withdraw from surveillance and even being able to want to, um, rather than longing to appear in the first place, are desires reserved for the privileged. So in How Not To Be Seen, Steyl's masterful tone handles what um, kind of violent surveillance imagery is linked to and the possible erasure of certain people by means of surveillance cultures. We see a series of lessons in how to become invisible through disguise, which offer to queer the frightening power of the amb ambiently data-valent smartphone. But in the end, it's not disappearance that have viewers learn, but rather we learn to analyze and make links between different cultures of surveillance that we may see or not see in our everyday lives. So I'd argue that the, um, the true achievement of this film is to make visible the impossibility of truly withdrawing from surveillance and for complicity with regimes that go beyond just questions of sort of being private, having secrets, being um, kind of having that private sphere and actually interact with the construction of unequal um, landscapes of subjectivity and constructions of the world around those different subjectivities by technologies of image creation. And there's a slightly different focus on the difficulty of withdrawal in How to Disappear, a 2020 short film by the Austrian collective of Leonhard Müller, Robin Klengel and Michael Stumpf, subtitled Deserting from Battlefield. How to Disappear is an anti-war film that the filmmakers write seeks opportunities for peace in the most unlikely place of a war game and made under the auspices of a digital disarmament movement called Total Refusal. The film is actually a recording from the image track of the multiplayer video game Battlefield 5, hence deserting from Battlefield rather than deserting from A or the Battlefield. So the filmmakers played the game and then they recorded their playing and sampled the footage, shaping it into essayistic format. And it's narrated by an AI with a charming Austrian accent. The player director's starting point is to work out, is it possible to desert within a war game? When their character is a soldier, how can he or they um, not perpetrate acts of war, but find a route towards pacifism or disappearance completely from the game? It turns out though, to be very difficult to desert battlefield. If the character runs away from the battle, the landscape becomes unpeopled, vague, and it turns out you can't escape, whether by sea or by land. And when the character tries to walk away from the battle, the edges of the game space become really quickly apparent. So the character walks towards the sea and it's a little bit like in the Truman Show, there isn't anywhere further to go uh, beyond the sea, the landscape just stops. So the edges of this video game world are blurry and indistinct. They can't get very far by swimming in the water either. And if they try to run away on land, they're very quickly executed as a deserter. The graphics are admittedly pretty intense. There's a strong effect of passivity in the film, emphasized by the fact that it is recorded from the image track of an existing computer game, 
So they were playing in spectator mode. They didn't make the game themselves, which means they can't actually author the game and have very little control over what happens to their character and what we can then see, what they can film for their film. There's more control though in the soundtrack to the film. Um, a soldier's cry of pain, for instance, interrupts the voiceover. And there's this moment of empathy then that breaks the form of the video with the soldier crying out in pain. Admittedly, it's a sound from within the logic of the, the video game itself, but at least they can sample that sound. And then there was also separately composed music, which makes reference to the sounds in the film, but is its own independent work. So the makers did find ways of commenting on the image track, even though they couldn't fully author it. The voiceover says there is no war without desertion. And the filmmakers have said about the film that this is a tribute to disobedience and desertion in both digital and physical real warfare. And they say the film revolves around the history of deserters, a part of human history which has hardly been illuminated. And they also link this frightening video game environment, as Style does in her own way in her film, to the broader terms of today's audiovisual entertainment machine, in their words. So the character in this film tries hiding by camouflaging themselves in bushes to escape execution, but the battle quickly finds them. They also try obstructing others who are about to fire their weapons, but without success. In fact, the only time their hands don't have guns in them is when they're swimming in the sea. When they try to drop their guns, another weapon is immediately delivered by the video game into their hands. Sadly, the end of the experiment is suicide. The only way out for the soldier is to drop a grenade at their own feet or to jump somewhere deadly while they're being chased. As the voiceover says, in this war game, it's the software which upholds the rules and its power is divine. The software prevents desertion by leading the character to have to die, either by their own hand or by execution. This problem of there being no way out, of course, recalls Bartleby, Herman Melville's 1857 short story subtitled The Tale of Wall Street. Bartleby is a legal clerk who resists the capitalist system around him by refusing to do any tasks, saying merely he prefers not to do anything that's required of him. And Bartleby has been celebrated in cultural theory for the power of no, that Deleuze and others celebrate in his actions, but he also disappears. While the walls of Wall Street and the prison that houses him stay upright, he disappears because he can't bring himself to even eat, to collaborate in the system even to that basic degree. So to take it back to the question of my presentation, what is the way to disappear? If we're thinking more broadly about today's audio audiovisual entertainment archipelago, what if technology users want to secure some privacy or even secrecy for ourselves away from the abuses of the internet age, of the smartphone that's also recording me as I speak, as well as Zoom, which is technically spyware in its own right? While these abuses often occur without the full knowledge of all technology users, there is an undeniable complicity on the part of us who consume these and use these technologies and rely on them. They draw us into becoming unofficial participants in data mining practices that are radically undermining already very delicate foundations of a contemporary shared world. But I did want to end on a hopeful note and argue that the short films do show, although there isn't a way out, there are German and Austrian filmmakers innovating formats to imagine the kinds of way out that there could be or potentially should be. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Amy, for this very interesting paper. I'm sure there will be many questions um, when we get to the discussion state. Um, and thanks also for this hopeful note at the end. It's a difficult, a very complex topic. But um, we'll move on now um, because we will save time at the end for all the, dis for, uh, for the discussions of all papers. So we'll move on to our next speaker. Um, let me introduce uh, Professor Matthew Podolsky, who is Professor of English at the University of Utah, author of several books, especially relevant for our topic today is his most recent book entitled The National Security Sublime on the Aesthetics of Government Secrecy, published in uh, 2019. Today, um, he will be arguing for attending to the aesthetic quality of secrets, which teaches us things beyond ethical and epistemological qualities. So now the floor is open to you, Matthew. We look forward to hearing your presentation. Thank you. And Thank you. Remember two minutes 
um, before the end of the presentation. Yes. I'll be on okay. screen again. <laughs> okay. I was cutting furiously last week. So um, let me uh, let me share my screen here. Okay, I hope that's working. Um, <clears throat> we are accustomed to thinking about secrecy as a problem of knowledge or ethics, a matter above all of epistemological privilege and or social power. Uh, today, I wanna to describe another way of thinking about secrets, one that has to this point received relatively little systematic attention from scholars, but that I would maintain holds analytical promise particularly in a world where technological innovation and the dominance of what Shoshana Zuboff has called surveillance capitalism threatens the very possibility of secret keeping for citizens in developed nations. Borrowing a turn of phrase from Claire Birchall, I will call this dimension the aesthetics of secrecy. And while I am of course interested in the uses of secrecy in art and literature, this is not all I want the term to designate. Secrets inherently have a look and a feel as well as a content. Beyond their value as information, they also collect a range of images, narratives, and affects. Jacques Derrida refers to his taste for the secret, a phrase I think can be taken quite literally, according to both meanings of the word taste. Secrets and their influence in the world can be understood as sensory phenomenon and as the object of the kinds of judgment we traditionally associate with art and beauty. The secret in itself, the very fact of its existence and circulation, even apart from what it conceals, draws into its orbit a range of aesthetic strategies and effective responses that seek to make it visible or describe its effects for the one who knows it or for the one who desires to know it. At first glance, this idea might seem paradoxical or even nonsensical. According to the canonical definition, a secret is information deliberately concealed from another person or group. It is knowledge we consciously hold back keep hidden, prevent from circulating. How can something expressly concealed be the object of representation? Even a superficial survey of familiar secrecy metaphors offers a, pre a preliminary answer to this question. Secrets, for example, are commonly associated with darkness, veils, locked boxes, and sacred spaces. Georges Poulet directs us to the habitual connection between secrets and drawers or chests. Eve Sedgwick underscores the many images that cling to the queer closet. Hidden information can be represented through a range of affects they, it evokes as well, from curiosity and suspicion to fear and awe. Secrets produce narratives, stories of initiation, confession, conspiracies, and detection. These images, feelings, and narratives operate even, and perhaps especially, in the absence of the information secrets withhold dwelling in the tension between concealment and revelation. Indeed, in many areas of life, like religion or national security, the subject of my book, the aesthetics of secrecy are primary rather than secondary, almost wholly defining our relationship with the hidden. Religions need an aesthetic of, of the secret because divine will is always a mystery. Writers and artists concerned with espionage and national security have a similar need, because their subjects too, as Timothy Melly and Ava Horn have noted, is, a sen is necessarily kept from the general public. Academic research on secrecy is focused largely on the canonical model of the secret, foregrounding questions of epistemology and, and ethics over aesthetics. But there are important clues for an aesthetics of secrecy hidden in this model. As Cicela Bach writes in her influential study of the ethics of secrecy, for example, to keep a secret from someone is to block information about it or evidence of it from that person and to do so intentionally to prevent him from learning it and thus from possessing it, making use of it or revealing it. Let me draw your attention to an important distinction Bach makes here. The secret she suggests is made up of at least two parts, the hidden information itself and information about it or evidence of it. There is the secret itself, the kernel of information, and then the means of concealing it, which leave visible or knowable traces. In his 1907 study of secrets and secret societies, Georg Simmel writes in a similar key that, quote, the secret is a general sociological form 
which stands in neutrality above the value function of its contents. It is a technique, a way of doing things with information, an outer envelope that can hold any manner of knowledge. What both Simmel and Bach recognize is that one can talk about secrets without knowing their content. Secrecy and revelation are always mutually intricated. As Irving Goffman economically puts it, secrets are information about information, not just the hidden kernel, but the discourses surrounding it as well. This characteristic of secrets is epitomized by the Egyptian god Harpocrates, who is typically depicted with a silencing finger held up to his lips. Harpocrates has a secret, but does not share it with us. Instead, he enjoins us to keep the secret a secret. The finger held over the lips epitomizes the way in which the outer envelope of secrets can operate in the absence of specific hidden information. Consider too the child on the schoolyard who announces, I have a secret, but I'm not going to tell you. The information that the child conceals is most likely beside the point. What really draws the attention of the other children is the mere presence of the secret, the evidence to use box word that a secret exists and it is being kept from them. As a way of demonstrating the analytical value of the aesthetic of, aesthetics of secrets, let me sketch out a very brief history of some common metaphors for revelation drawn from the discourses of religion, literature, and popular culture. I hope to show how specific attention to this dimension of secrecy can be interdisciplinary and also highly attentive to cultural differences. My examples come from Western discourses, but they would vary greatly if I were using examples from other cultures or historical moments. Let me begin, begin with a key ancient secret. In Exodus, when Moses descends from, from Mount Sinai bearing the tablets inscribed with the Ten Commandments, the Israelites notice that his face is shining because he had spoken directly with God. They are terrified and refuse to come near him, so he dons a veil that shields the divine radiance. He repeats this ritual every time he stands in the presence of God. Whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would take the veil off until he came out. And when he came out and told the Israelites what he had been commanded, the Israelites would see the face of Moses, that the skin of his face was shining. And Moses would put the veil on his face again until he went in to speak with him. This scene offers a powerful example of the manifold quality of secrets. There are in fact three layers here. God himself, the divine secret, whom only Moses is permitted to see directly the divine radiance of Moses' face, which provides terrifying evidence of this secret, and the veil, which covers the radiance and brings Moses back into the human community. The two outer layers conceal and reveal at once. The shining face reveals Moses' proximity to the, to the divine, while the veil con uh, conceals what the face reveals. Both secrets have striking aesthetic effects, associating the divine secret, secret with radiance and light, which the veil in turn covers. This passage had a powerful influence on the ancient and medieval aesthetics of secrecy, which we can note in um, a typological reference from the New Testament. In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus leads Peter, James, and John up to a mountain to reveal his divinity. The description explicitly alludes to our passage from Exodus. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. Matthew both alludes to and modifies the image from Exodus. The shining face and the dazzling white clothes are here presented as both revelations and as secrets. While the Israelites were only permitted to see Moses veiled, the disciples look directly at Jesus, whose shining face represents divinity itself, not indirect in evidence of it. Even the veil of Moses becomes luminous, obviating its powers of concealment. Both of these biblical passages use the image of imagery of radiance in the veil and the emotions of awe and terror to describe the look and feel of the divine secret. In modernity, by contrast, secrets take on a different cast. Rather than representing the divine, they tend to be associated with ignorance, culpability, or conspiracy. There are the secrets of nature, which reflect the need to advance scientific knowledge, the guilty secrets of individuals who prevaricate to cover their transgressions, 
and the secrets of the political powers that be who try to conceal their wicked machinations from the public. I can think of no better place to observe this shift than the writings of Anne Radcliffe, whose 18th century Gothic novels powerfully transform the dictums of enlightenment science and political theory into durable aesthetic modes. In place of radiance and awe, she gives us darkness and terror, ways of reckoning, reckoning with hidden knowledge that, like the image of divine radiance, are still very much with us today. Consider the description of a key secret from the first chapter of Radcliffe's early novel, A Sicilian Romance, from 1790. At the beginning of the novel, Radcliffe, Radcliffe's characters have been terrified by a mysterious light that appears in the disused southern wing of the Mazzini castle in Sicily. When the servant Vincent falls ill, he calls for the good-hearted governess, Madame de Menon, to his bedside to confess what he knows. I would impart to you a secret which lies heavy at my heart and which makes my last moments dreadful as they are without hope, he tells her. At the brink of revelation, however, Vincent faints. Madame de Menon calls attendants who bring him briefly back to consciousness, but he remains speechless, leaving the secret unrevealed. Like the veil of Moses, Vincent's unfinished confession puts the emphasis on the evidence of the secret rather than its content. It is like a veil thrown over the light in the southern wing. But note that the light here signifies mystery rather than divinity. It is the secret itself rather than the radiance that reveals it, its existence. For the European Gothic, secrets are inevitably represented by darkness and obscurity. The secret is the absence of light and the light itself typically associated with human reason rather than divine revelation. The affects associated with secrecy are different here too. The secret for Radcliffe is explicitly guilty, relating in this novel to a concealed crime perpetrated by the Marquis of Mazzini. I won't give the story away. Vincent describes it as heavy, a metaphor that, that describes the feeling of guilt and responsibility. For her part, Madame de Menon is initially struck with, quote, perplexity and astonishment, and then with wonder, affects not all that different from what we find in Exodus and Matthew. But Radcliffe quickly replaces this mood with nagging, quote, curiosity, uh, enlightenment epistemology corrupted by cons conspiratorial intent. A veil of mystery enveloped that part of, ca of the castle, Radcliffe writes, which now seemed impossible should ever be penetrated since the only person who could have removed it was no more. The presence of a secret changes the very look and feel of the world for Madame de Menon. Her world becomes dark and mysterious, confusing and threatening. The veil here is not protective, but terrifying, evidence of evil rather than a means of shielding the divine. I argue in my recent book, The National Security Sublime, that the rise of big data is bringing about another ethical shift in the aesthetics of secrecy, similar to the one that we have observed in the move from the biblical to the Gothic paradigm. In addition to biblical images of divine radiance and Gothic images of conspiratorial darkness, we also find a new association of secrecy with the sublime, an aesthetic divined by the massive, infinite, and ungraspable. Perhaps the most influential example of this new aesthetic comes in the final scene of Steven Spielberg's Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark. You'll recall that Indiana Jones has spent much of the film as a deputized agent of the American government tracking down an archeologist who has recovered the legendary Ark of the Covenant, the gold plated wooden chest that according to the story in Exodus was constructed by Moses to hold the tablets inscribed with the 10 commandments. The archeologist has sold his services to the Nazis who believe the Ark can be a weapon in the war against allied forces. When Indy and Marion have finally tracked down the Ark, they watch from a distance as the archeologist and his Nazi patrons open the lid to see what's inside. A blinding pillar of light emerges from the chest, killing everyone present except Indy and Marion, who wisely cover their eyes. When Indy brings the Ark back to the army intelligence agents who had sent him on his mission, they take control of the artifact, assuring him that they know what to do. Cut to the massive warehouse where the Ark, now encased in a wooden crate and stamped with a large serial number, 
is rolled to its resting place among what assumes to be countless other artifacts. Spielberg cleverly plays on both the biblical and the Gothic aesthetics of secrecy. The Ark is associated with radiance, here implicitly atomic rather than divine, and its fate is the subject of a dark conspiracy to control world affairs, signified by the Gothic shadows in the warehouse. But the image introduces something new, evidence of the secret signified by massive size and overwhelming number. Concealed by a warehouse full of artifacts rather than a veil or an unfinished confession, intended by government agents rather than prof prophets or servants, the secret is akin to a proverbial needle in a haystack. It reflects a cultural context in which secrets are just as likely to be hidden by overwhelming flows of data as by a devious intent. Even our personal secrets are no longer the things we labor to keep private. Um, government spies and tech companies alike discern our concealed de desires by finding patterns in the digital trails we leave behind. Spielberg in this way anticipates the works of artists like Trevor Paglin, whose influential photographs of the material culture of national security draw upon the romantic aesthetics of the sublime, updated for a world defined by information overload. Paglin replaces the Gothic shadows that we find in so many government conspiracy films from the 1970s with bright light, but this does not mark a return to the biblical aesthetics of radiance. Instead, it signifies the curious visibility of the open secret, the traces of a secret world that stand unconcealed in the landscape, but that we are unable to, to process and expressly forbidden to investigate. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, would you please close your screen? There Thank you. you. Thank you. Um, well, great. That was a fascinating paper. And also thank you for bringing in the biblical imagery. Sorry, that was my alarm. So just I'm on track to bringing in the biblical imagery um, for revelation and concealment. I'm sure we'll be following up on this um, very interesting um, imagery you brought in, uh, in your paper. Um, and but now let me let us move to our third speaker today. Um, I think the screen is not is still on. I mean, you're still sharing your screen. Oh, yes. OK, thank you. So our third speaker today is um, Christina Plamadiala, excuse me, I hope I pronounced it properly, a surname. So um, Christina is a postdoctoral fellow at Loughborough University and McGill University. Her project investigates the cultural history of the surveillance practices of the Securitate under Colchesco's regime. Um, today, um, her paper is entitled Recruitment of Securitate Informers in Communist Romania. Psychographies in Securitate Files. So her paper examines the concept of uh, psychography. Is that the way you pronounce it? Because it's also a concept that you have developed yourself. Well, um, yeah, it's psychography. Psychography, right. right. In relation to the study of Securitate archives and to the recruitment methods of Securitate informants. Informers. So thank you. We're looking forward to hearing your paper now. Thank you very much for the introduction. Can you see I the first... slides? Yes, yes. Yes, okay, perfect. Thanks. Okay. Can you hear me well? Yeah. Um, before I start the, the presentation, I'd like to warn you I have a one year old daughter. Uh, she's in the house, and you might hear her a bit. My husband is very much with her, but just a warning, um, she might sound a bit bubbly sometimes. Um, and second of all, um, who is assisting you with the slides? Because I'm not handling them. Is it a grid? Or yes, it's grid. So may, can we, can I say slide? And that, and that means that we'll, we'll move on to the next slide. Is that okay? Yeah. All right, because I don't see grid. Um, so I, I assume that grid has heard them. Okay, so, um, all right, well, um, First of all, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today 
about a subject um, that is of great interest to me and, um, and to share with you my research um, that I have conducted in the past six years or so um, in the Council, in the in Securitate Archives that are currently located at the Council for the Study of Securitate Archives in Communist Romania. Um, it's, it's based um, in Bucharest, um, in Romania nowadays. The council is, has all these files under its custody and allows researchers like me, uh, victims and collaborators alike, former um, collaborators, of course, to visit these files and research them. I, uh, I'm, uh, I just am a researcher. So my, my approach to the files are, um, hopefully objective um, in the sense that I don't have, uh, unlike a former victim, would probably the conclusion would be very different than what I am going to present today. Now slide, please. Um, yeah. The aim of this paper um, is to introduce the concept of psychography in order to describe the way in which Securitate uh, recruited many of its informers. Now slide, please. Psychography is a concept that I have developed while doing my doctoral work, and I'm currently working on it during my postdoctoral fellowship. And here's how I define it. It's a type of life scrutiny, and I, I put the notes also in the slide, um, given that we are on, um, speaking on Zoom, so probably if you cannot hear me well, I, I put the, the most important notes um, on the slides as well. So psychography is a type of life scrutiny and rewriting that involves collecting biographical data on someone that provides sufficient clues about a person's vulnerabilities, core beliefs, character, and identity, or to use the language of ancient Greeks about a person's psuche. Psuchegraphy is a precursor to recruitment and many individuals can be successfully manipulated by this method because it seeks to jeopardize that which is considered of most importance to a human being. Now in this paper, and actually in all my research, I lean towards an Aristotelian understanding of psuche. Psuche in itself is a, is a very complex uh, concept. Philosophers and theologians have been arguing about it for a long time. And uh, uh, Dr. Potolsky, you have touched upon the theological uh, subjects. So, um, uh, actually made me think about connect, potential connections with my presentation, be, um, but we'll discuss that in the uh, question and answer period. So according to Aristotle, humans' psuche is, quote, their actuality, that which entails a degree of another, of interaction with, another, with other human beings. A psuche encompasses all the capacities and powers granted to a human being, it entails a person's identity, feelings, sentiments, and vulnerabilities. In other ways, a psuche is the actual self. Now, slide, please. Now, what is the connection of psychography to the overall uh, theme of the webinar? Obviously, secrecy. Now, the bigger the secrecy and disguise on the process of writing a psychography on someone, the larger is the exploitative aim of the operation undertaken to do this psychographic work. Now, to do psychographic work on someone is often to uncover a secret they have, they keep in their, in their hearts. Examples of secrets uncovered by Securitate agents were extramarital affairs, someone's bourgeois past, criminal past, ties to the former fascist Iron Guard organization, ties to foreigners, uh, living abroad, all these things that were forbidden. Okay? Now, this aspect of psychographic work is the most relevant to the theme of this webinar. Someone's secret was often a vulnerability, as I discuss next, threatening to make it public, such as, uh, for example, uh, one's secret, making it public or exploiting it in some way or another, was enough for many people to agree to collaborate with, this, with the secret police in communist Romania. Slide, please. Now, what are the sources used in this paper? I've given you a few clues. Um, as I said, I'm doing research in the Securitate archives. Actually, for this uh, paper, um, I use Securitate instructional materials on the art of espionage. Yes, indeed, all these 
agents were trained. And I do, I have consulted um, about 25 instructional materials employed, um, five or so of them on actual how to do recruitment of people. And I've also compared the conclusions and the guidelines provided in these manuals with actual files on how recruitment took place. And of course, they don't reflect the full story, but they do say something. Um, and these materials, these instructional materials, lay out um, a four-stage protocol on how to acquire collaborators and informers, okay? It's a protocol based on which Securitate officers carried out what I refer in this paper's psychographic work. Um, now, why do I say work? Actually, I borrowed the word work um, in, in Romanian lucru from Securitate's own vocabulary. As you may know, uh, every secret police has it, had its own jargon, and that's the verb it used um, to describe when someone was targeted for recruitment. The verb alucra, to work. The adjectival form lucrat, worked. The expression lot and lucru, which means taken to be worked in these files, not just in manuals. And the known noun lucrare, work, I used in these files on potential recruits or informers to indicate that someone was processed, actual word processed for potential recruitment. Similarly to the way in which a carpenter can create out of a piece of wood, something distinguishable to the human eye, or recreate out of an object something else that serves a function different from its original purpose. The securitate sought to change its targets by working them. Okay, so uh, next slide, please. Now here you have uh, a few examples of what these files look like um, that I work with. Uh, the first of these images, you see Archiva in Romanian, it's actually uh, the cover of the file and um, other two documents are actual documents that I, that I you know, they, they look like that and um, I read them and it has become a part of my daily life almost as part of my research. Next slide, please. Now let's talk a bit about this four-stage protocol that I discussed uh, earlier um, that is highlighted in these manuals. So there are four, four, four steps, right? The first one is identification of potential candidates. Um, and I provide the Romanian version as well. The second stage, it's the study and background check of potential candidates. And that's where the actual psychographic work fits in, and I'll discuss it um, a bit later. Stage three, it's very obvious, straightforward selection of candidates. And stage four, recruitment. Now in this presentation, I won't discuss stage three and four because it doesn't uh, pertain as much to the subject of secrecy uh, of this webinar. And I'll focus heavily on stage two, where the actual analysis of people took place, analysis and study, and where many times their secrets were revealed and hence, when threatened that their secrets were to be used in some way or another, people often said yes to collaboration, which is something that they would have been reluctant to do so. Not all of them, but yeah, I can't speak for everyone, but for many of them. Okay, so, uh, next slide, please. All right. Um, briefly discuss uh, stage one, identification of potential candidates. At this stage, the potential candidate was under the Securitate's gaze. It came from department chiefs who identify people most likely to be, quote, attracted to collaboration. I use actual words and jargon from these files. Um, once someone was eyed for recruitment, this person had to be studied on life history, personality, friends, foes, and life goals were under thorough scrutiny. Note also the idea of life goals. That was also vulnerability because people were, people were willing to do at times, uh, were willing to accept certain things uh, in the name of pursuing their dreams, like pursuing a doctorate, going abroad, studying abroad and so forth. And that vulnerability was also what I call a psuche, something that made them who they were. Now I provide here two images of files, how they look like these days in these um, in this in the Chinesas or in the in the council at the council that um, that the guards were that is the custodian of these files. 
Um, now, next slide, please. We'll talk about uh, stage two. Now, stage two is the actual uh, study of potential candidates. Um, now, agents looked for the following things when uh, they were doing that study. And this is information comes from these manuals, but also is corroborated with the files on these on, on targets. They're looking for a person's character, personal background, one's social ties. Um, and as I said earlier, they're also looking for vulnerabilities or, or what, they, what the Securitate used as word um, compromising material. Instructive manuals on this very subject offer a lot of guidelines on how to find out the person by a person's character. Um, and unfortunately, the time doesn't permit me to, to, to cover all this. But I offer here a few examples uh, of these types of guidelines. I, I translate them so that you can get the feel of the actual wording. For example, one had to look for Kenneth's quote, conception of an attitude towards Romania's social political system. In other words, someone's political orientation. One had to look for one's patriotic sentiments, political orientation, political discernment, or social and family situation. According to Emmanuel, one's family situation and social ties show the true reality about a human being, one manual states. Another manual states that one's possibilities to inform are determined in essence by the trust that the candidates for recruitment have from those targeted and from the possibility of the evolution of the respective relationships with them. The larger the sphere of possibilities of information one has, the more useful one becomes for the police." End of quote. Uh, next slide, please. Now, again, let's, let's discuss a bit what exactly what, what they were looking for when they were investigating a person's character. The Securitate was investigating both the positive and negative aspects of one's character. Eliminate from the list of potential candidates those with a fiery and passionate personality. They were looking for people who demonstrated, quote, sincerity, correctness, objectivity in their reproduction of facts, vigilance, courage, discretion, and so forth, tact, calmness, prudence, and self-control. They were looking to, for ways to discern if the target was intelligent. They had good auditory and visual memory. All these things were important to conduct their spying operations. If they had self-control and retention skills. But you, you may ask yourself how they were able to find out all this information at a time when there was no iPad, no iPhone, no, no computer that we have these days. Well, they did so by talking to their neighbors, employers, colleagues, meeting with them undercover with the potential targets. Some agents knew their targets in other contexts. Some were students at the same high school or university. And even at some point may even had some, you know, they were friends. Officers collected all this information through informer notes, so, or the so-called characterizations in Romanian characterizai. Neighbors, bosses, friends, and colleagues wrote characterizations as the example uh, that I am going to provide to you illustrate. So here's actual characterization. Beginning of quote, comrade FTZ, the actual abbreviations of the name, electrician is a dependable man, well-prepared professionally, works the free shifts, never missed work without a proper excuse. He's married and has two children. I do not know any other issues concerning his family. So what kind of information does this characterization offer? Indirectly, it says that this person is reliable, that works very well, is, has a family, is dependable. All these information were then noted and uh, further processed, so to speak, in order to create um, a profile on who this person they were, they were, they were, they were targeting is. Now, following the selection of candidates, officers wrote reports where they where they're detailed their reasoning why certain people could be recruited. And these reports had to be approved by chief officers who had the final say in both the recruitment and the removal of informers from the surveillance network. Generally, a report with a proposal to recruit contained the following information. The aim of recruitment and the candidate's vulnerabilities. The candidate's biographical history, 
marital status, an employment situation, the abilities to provide information to the securitate, as well as the warranty that one would collaborate locally. In it, a person's recruitment had to be justified based on, quote, patriotic sentiments due to mutual interest or based on compromising information. Next slide, please. Um, okay, actually, please, next slide. We already discussed that. Now, let's talk a bit about compromising information. Again, this ties into the, the subject of secrecy because compromising information, one often sought to keep it uh, to oneself and not disclose it publicly. For the Securitate, the compromising information was the vulnerability, a vulnerability which was either actively exploited by the Securitate officers, the psychographic work, or was sufficient by itself to compel a person to collaborate. Whether a person was motivated to collaborate in order to pursue a doctorate, revenge, travel abroad, ensure that one's marital affair is not revealed to the spouse, revenge or out of place, misplaced patriotism, all these reasons stem from a person's vulnerability, I, I argue. A compromising material was any kind of information about someone that if revealed to a certain person, group of people, association or any other entity was bound to cause harm, physical, psychological, financial, emotional, and reputational to the respective person. In the eyes of the Securitate, it was the case of the Stasi police, anything, anything that one, one, one considered that it was made them vulnerable was enough to make the person consider collaboration as a way to protect that vulnerability. And now, in order to illustrate further, because words say something, but, the, but images also, it, Say a lot of other things. Let's move on to the next slide. Please. I will show you actual images from these manuals that give us a clue about the things that these agents learn in order to learn more, in order to, to learn more about human psychology with the goal of uncovering a person's character and vulnerable points. Here you have an actual page from one of these manuals um, where the body types typology theory of William Herbert Sheldon are illustrated. As you can see, these theories, of course, are outdated. But at one point, they do did believe that once the shape of one's body somehow had a lot to do and reflected a person's character and um, identity and so forth. Next slide, please. And now the body types typology, according to Ernest Kretschmer, uh, with the same idea. And next slide, please. Pavlov's dog and Skinner's box, of course, um, used as a uh, as, a, as part of their study of um, of human psychology and how to educate someone or re-educate in that purpose. So, uh, with that, um, with the spirit of keeping my presentation short and to the point, um, I I ended. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak about about this concept, about the idea behind it, and to also provide you with um, the article where all this information uh, is laid out in a more detailed form as appeared. And it's an article that appeared in the general biography. And I thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Christina, for this very fascinating talk. Um, I'm sure there will be many questions. Uh, before I open the floor to the discussion, I, I was just one. I just wanted to highlight again the kind of um, connecting elements between these different talks. Again, as I said in the introduction, this kind of calibration and negotiation between what is to be exposed and what is to be hidden against the backdrop of surveillance remains a, um, um, a connecting theme. So what was this also what came also to the fore, um, especially in Matthew's um, paper, is that we need to um, take into account different definition of definitions of secrecy and the kind of the different or uh, the changing notions of secrecy through time. So that's certainly a topic we should um, um, discuss further, and there will be. Um, 
many questions, I think. And also with regards to Annie Ring's paper, we will have to maybe also try to understand what it means to be invisible and what you actually, what, how do you imagine, even if those filmmakers are trying to make that very visible, what does it actually mean? And what does it mean in the discourse in the context of privacy? No, because then it all comes down to how you define identity. And this opens yet another big field, a complex field. So um, before I ask questions, I would probably um, would like to invite people if, um, to, to get started. Um, and does anyone have any particular questions for our speakers? I mean, I will have I would have many, but uh, I'll just you know I would like to uh, give you a preference now. So, oh yes, there are two. So grit and any ring. <laughs> yeah. Hi. Do you want me to start? Is that okay? That's fine. Yes. Yeah. I, I didn't know who who did the hat. I mean, you you lose track easily. No. Yes. <laughs> no. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah. Um. Well, thanks to any Matthew and Christina for their really interesting papers. Um, I guess I have a um, question for Christina, because it's sort of very, there are a lot of overlaps with uh, the state security and how they recruited their um, collaborators. And I wondered what sort of was missing from your paper and that I'm quite interested in, is in how, how far was there actually a change in their recruitment strategies, given that the Cold War was quite a long period, you know, 40 years, um, because that was definitely something we we noticed with um, the Stasi recruitment, that there were definitely changes over time where they sort of, you know, fine-tuned their, their strategy. So I wondered whether there was also something with the Securitate, given that there are so many overlaps, because obviously um, it's the KGB that they were trained in, sort of checkist rule. Thanks. Should I answer now? Yeah. Uh, yes, I think it's better because otherwise we'll lose track. Right? So it's better yeah. to respond uh, immediately. Absolutely. So um, for my research, um, there's a there's a change in the recruitment from the Stalinist, the first two decades, where there was a lot more violence, um, in actual torture at times, um, to a more subtle, um, very as I describe, you know, by using someone's vulnerability, very sort of civil, but very, 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 very powerful. I mean, I'm using civil with very careful, it's not the actual word, but civil versus being tortured physically in that sense, um, that I noticed. Um, I <laughs> first, I'm first to hear what the studies, how they were managing, but definitely in the first two decades of communism, the 40s, 50, the 50s and the 60s, prior to Ceausescu's coming, um, the methods were way more visibly torturous. And I'm not saying that, that when someone used one's vulnerability uh, to compel one, um, it wasn't, it was less because, but it was less visible as, as the Foucault, you know, on the soul, um, pain on the soul, but not the body. The body remained intact, but the mind and the soul were affected. So that's that's overall what I would say. There was a shift in that way from physical torture and to, to less torture and more uh, psychological manipulation and, and you know pointing towards vulnerability. Okay. Um, now um, it's Annie's turn, but then we also have to keep uh, track on the um, questions in the chat box. But so Annie, you go first, please. Thank you. I'm conscious that Betiel, you also posed questions for each of us. So let me know when you'd like us to address them. Um, my question is for Christina about how or to what degree these interests, for instance, in Pavlov and in the study of personality were actually used by the Securitate. Because as you know, um, from my book, After the Stasi, I was interested in the fact that the Stasi had all of these sort of psychological techniques that they were researching 
mm -hmm. and teaching their recruits as well at the Juristische um, Hochschule in Potsdam. I don't think they actually did anything with them. It was kind of a pet interest. So I can't, I can mm -hmm. see they kind of fed into a culture of fine, we view the subject in a Pavlovian rather than a Freudian sense. But it just seemed like kind of a bit of, um, like they didn't really know how to actually apply them in terms of spying and their spying really was just kind of spying and being um, pernicious and, and um, kind of bullying people basically, which was not theoretically informed in any sense. So I'm wondering if there's a difference there and if the Securitate really did apply these theories and ideas in any systematic fashion. You're raising a very good point. Um, I cannot guarantee, but but the fact that things have changed from the very torturous methods to something uh, less torturous, and I'm using less torturous on the body, but not on the mind, uh, suggests that um, there was a change and there was more embrace of the understanding of human psychology. Overall, I'm not speaking on a specific person. And that probably also has to do with the fact that the quality of those of the agents, their education in general, the personality, they were hiring a more educated cohort, so to speak. So, well, I cannot guarantee that, you know, they were the person who has tried to manipulate person X used Pavlo Dog's theory, and I cannot trace that. I could, I could see a trend of, higher, more sophistication from the part of the handler and the agent. And by that, I could probably say that they were more aware of all these things. But I could, I do see a visual reflection of the four stage protocol that they, that the manual states with how they were reporting their, their recruitment. And that in itself doesn't show fully how the recruitment took place what was happening in the mind of the person, what the recruitment took place, but the actual writing it down so that the, the superior in the chain of would read it. So, but that by itself doesn't guarantee that they were 100% copy and pasting theory to how it, they were at working. They were aware. And they were also aware because the manuals that I've read, like in the library, old, old fashioned way, there is a, the, the, the cover has them the back people and signatures and who was reading it and so forth. There's, there are people writing it and you know reading it and signing it in 89 and 76. Or, so obviously people were reading. I mean, I'm not saying that everyone was reading it. Uh, so I'm trying to be very careful with my words, not to say that, oh, for sure, they were very much conscious of it, of, of all the theories that I spoke about, but some were. I'm, I'm more comfortable to say that. And um, it's a very good point that you're making and maybe I should have made it more clearly, Annie, that just because the instructor manual say so, it doesn't mean that when it came to the recruitment, everything happened per the protocol, but some things did happen. So thank you for um, that question, yeah. Um, yes, um, I'm just, um, before you can speak, Matthew, let me just respond to one of those remarks in the chat box. The last remark by um, Mark is uh, explicitly like directly following up on your discussion right now. He says, I agree with Annie, some Stasi manipulation techniques were more likely those of a pimp than of a psychologist. And um, yes, and it also kind of, um, it almost seems, and also your concept, the, the very interesting, intriguing concept you've developed, it almost seemed as if they had a more kind of noble goal in terms of kind of addressing the self and as, as if they didn't have like, you know, the Stasi, they were actually mainly interesting in that knowledge in order to sustain certain power structures. So I think, so that, 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 that did strike me because it almost looked like they had um, more, as I just said, a more kind of commandable kind of goal. How would you well, respond to that? Well, I'm not sure how a pimp really functions. I mean, versus a psychologist. So for me to respond to this uh, comment, I would probably have to be very versed in that kind of the psychology of the pimp. Um, um, but I do want to tell something. When I meant by self, if someone was threatening their children, 
a child was someone's vulnerability. And the closest word, you know, words don't really allow us to say everything. The closest word that I could find to the fact that someone's child was threatened and they were willing to do something, whether it was pimp psychology or regular psychiatry, it was their inner self was being at stake and therefore they were subject to what I call psychographic work. I'm not trying, by, by making it a word that touches on the soul and the self, I'm not trying to say that they were really fine connoisseur of psychology. What I'm trying to say is that I'm actually speaking on behalf of the victim. In that case, the person who was forced to, to say yes to things that maybe they were not willing because their child's future was on the line or their future is on the line. So um, I guess I'm trying to make that point. And I think it's very important um, to be, uh, I think your, the questions are very good. And maybe I should, when I, when I speak, I should make sure that I, I'm not trying to say that the ones who were, who were doing psychographic work really, really knew psychology. I think you can hurt someone psychologically without really knowing all the theories of psychology. And I think that's, that's my approach. You can really harm someone without knowing who Freud was or who was what, what Pavlov dog is all about. And I think that's, that's, that's my angle. Okay. okay, thank you, Christina. So now to Matthew. Thank you. Um, those are two really great papers. I have, so I had a, just a follow-up question for Christina and then um, a question <laughs> for Annie too, I'm sorry. Those, those, those um, slides were just too fascinating. I actually think maybe the most interesting group of slides was the ones with the, the images of bodily morphology. Oh, um, exactly. Which was kind of like a, a mid-century science. Oh, like yes. Something scientific like, but, but there it really is about the body. Right, um, and I'm yeah. kind of curious about what they did with that, and yeah. how that. I mean, that's not really psychology. I mean, I guess there were some sort of psychological connections, but but that's really about the body type and what the body type yeah. tells you, and yeah. so it's well, about the manifest rather than the secret soul. Um, so I'm interested in how you would would do that, and then maybe I'll, I'll sort of like leave you with that, and then I had just a quick question for Annie too that she can take afterward, which was. Um, um, I noticed in my book that, that um, representations of surveillance and, and national security changed a lot, like right around the time that reporting started happening about secret um, government surveillance programs. And I was just curious about whether, you know, what the timing was, the sort of, if there were, um, uh, when those films came out, um, and whether there were any changes that could track to news that came out about surveillance um, programs like um, the Sn Snowden, but even earlier ones as well. So thanks. Annie, would you like to answer first and I'll go second? Hello? Annie? Annie has hey, out for two, uh, for two minutes. Oh, there she is, sorry. <laughs> So why don't you go first, Christina, because uh, and then... Oh, okay, okay, all right. Um, so uh, Matthew, thank you for, um, for the question about body types. Now, um, I will go with what I'm sure, uh, and that is in the files that you see characterizations. There is some interest in how the person looks, not just how they behave. So some of them say, well, it looks on the, on the bigger side or you know that part of the characterization of the person so they were interested in that um i'm not sure if they really believed in the fact that the body says the, the, the way in which one's body shapes says something about the personality but body types theories i mean they're outdated and no one believes in that these days they they were about the fact that a person's body says something about who they are and what their personality traits are. And so I showed some of these images to kind of give you an idea of what they were seeing in these, what they were consulting in these manuals, uh, what they were doing with it. They were aware of these theories. I cannot really tell you if they were really practicing it, but they were exposed to these theories when they were consulting these manuals and probably during their training. Um, and I'm not sure who said, I think it was Annie who said, uh, um, 
we're not really sure if they were really applying everything they learned about psychology when they were doing the recruitment and dealing. So I wouldn't go as far as saying, oh yes, when they're meeting someone who was on the thin side, they were using this kind of body type. I, I wouldn't say that, but it's interesting and it's very curious to know that they were consulting that was part of their training. Um, I probably will do more research to see if there is more connection between what they were exposed to in their studies and actual files. But in the end, these files only say a bit of the story. I cannot tell the whole story from these files. And, um, and we have to be very humble about that. But you know, if, when I say right now what I say, I always try to make sure that I am not 100% certain because no one can be 100% certain from, from just reading a series of manuals and a series of files on a certain person. So I hope Matthew that I give you a bit of answer, but as I said, I have to be honest with the fact that I cannot fully attest to a connection, a full connection between the fact that they were exposed to these theories and the fact that they were applying them and they were influenced by how they saw people all the time. I think Matthew will maybe have to reformulate your question to Annie because uh, she didn't hear your question. Yes, I'll do that. Um, so Annie, I was just, um, those films were really fascinating. And what I was, what I had asked is that when I was in, in the material in my book, kind of about the, the emergence of this new aesthetic of secrecy, um, I, it, it tracked very um, specifically to news coming out about surveillance programs and, and new technologies. Um, so for example, the, um, and I could actually trace it to like the production schedule of films um, so I, I did a little research about when the films were conceived and when the production schedules happened. And it actually, you know, you could see the, the news, like big New York Times stories um, sparked imagery in certain films. And like the Snowden, Snowden story obviously was like a huge influence on that. So I wondered if you could just kind of give a little um, sort of, uh, you know, I missed if you, if you may have mentioned this in the paper, but I missed it, um, but what, if there's any changes in how those films represent surveillance and if it tracks at all to um, news after 9-11, especially about, um, about um, you know, sort of bulk surveillance programs. And uh, it also, I mean, if, if, you, if you wanna talk about this, uh, I'll just raise it as an issue, but like 1990s surveillance art um, and surveillance film was quite a bit different in this regard from what I think you're, you're um, noticing, but just kind of, uh, just, just asking for a little bit more kind of historical sense of when, when these things were happening and if there was an evolution. Um, you have to unmute yourself. <laughs> okay. Can you hear me all right now? Yes, yes. Okay. Sorry, I missed your question. I have a very sick kitten and she was making a noise. So yeah, I think I'm going to rush this with a bit after this, but sorry, you had to ask me twice. Um, yeah, it's a great question. The style film, it kind of belongs together with another one from the following year called Liquidity Inc. And I've often thought, am I, am I writing about these films in relation to the global financial crisis, which she refers to more in, in the partner film in Liquidity Inc.? Is this in relation to the Snowden files? So they're made in that spot between the war on terror, which she clearly references in the film, and COVID-19. What, what is that era? That's like 2001 to 2020. It's made in that era. So we have the war on terror, um, allied use of black spot prisons and um, extrajudicial violence and torture. And we have the, the financial crash. Um, then we have the leaks by Snowden and everyone, and the WikiLeaks, these are like sort of 2011 onwards. Um, and then I guess pandemic in 2020. So they're in that era between the leaks and the pandemic. But with style, you really get the feeling that she's, she's writing a longer history. And um, yeah, at the Berlinale, um, the week before last, they rescreened her film from 1997 that she made at film school about the Potsdamer Platz and uh, right-wing terrorism in Germany. And they could easily belong in a history with those films as well. And you have the sense that she's working on a really long scale project about the connections between audiovisual entertainment, global civil war, as she calls it, or 
illegal acts of warfare by the US and many, many other countries um, and surveillance. So I kind of think it's with her work, it, it fits into that really long history from the war on terror till now. And I definitely see changes in it, perhaps mediatic changes. In those two films, you see her Mac desktop as one of, I didn't have time to show it in my slides, but as one of her images, and you can see that she's editing the film. You can see her using her cursor to pull different images into the frame. And that looks very different to her 1997 film, which has loads of live action documentary footage of protests and of like diggers digging up Potsdam Platz. So they have, there's a clear aesthetic historical difference. But I sort of think the topics around surveillance and complicity are very much there. It's a longer timeline with style. And then with the video game, I was interested in this. I think that their um, that Austrian film about how do you desert in a war game, I'd sort of link that to anti-surveillance activism in the German speaking world from sort of 2013 onwards, so after the Snowden leaks and the WikiLeaks, set Snowden and Harrison, sorry, the, the women who leak this information never get named or acknowledged. And, um, uh, in what they do. If you want to read about the women and leaky information, there's an article by my colleagues, Ag um, Daniel Ag Agostino and Nana Tulstra about women who are involved in those leaks and we should, who we should really always reference when we talk about them. So the Snowden and Harrison leaks, for instance, they had a massive impact in Germany and there were those big demos in the summer of 2015 about like getting, getting away from control and wanting to be anti-surveillance. And I see it in a really specific German speaking tradition of anti-surveillance movements. That kind of ties into what Vita was asking in the questions earlier around, is there something specific around German speaking, film making and counter surveillance reflections and culture? I think so. I think in the German speaking world, I mean, I hope so, because I'm writing a book about specifically German speaking filmmakers and surveillance film. Um, so I sort of hope there's something specific. I think in the German speaking world, it's less right wing to talk about privacy and the private sovereign subject. That is still a kind of left liberal notion. Whereas I think in the Anglo world, that's very much a libertarian right wing idea that's much more problematic. And I think that plays out in the culture as, as well, in cultural productions as well. That's my deeply held instinct um, about that. And I'd be very happy to be challenged. Yes, thank you, um, Annie. I'll um, I let, um, because Anselma has been waiting for a while, and probably after that, we will have to catch up with those questions in the chat box. That's kind of multitasking is a bit challenging, but let's, um, um, would you like to speak, um, Anselma? Would you like to raise a question? Uh, thank you very much. Um, thanks, Annie, as well. I, th I think I agree with you. I think in, in, certainly in Germany, there's always been much more concern about surveillance and CCTV cameras, for example. While it's in the UK, the debate is always about ID cards for some bizarre reason. <laughs> We're just throwing that in there, in there randomly. Um, those were three really, really great papers. Um, and I had... Uh, some questions, I think a question for uh, each of the speakers, just different ones. Um, so Annie, if you stay with your paper, I will just go through the three one after another. Um, I think at one point when you are reflecting on the, the difficulty of becoming invisible um, that's being raised by these films, you made a brief reference to power and suggested that it is harder the less power you have, if that's right. Although I wonder, I wonder because this, you know, in some of the, the kind of the really bad TV that I watch, the people who live off the grid, as it's often referred to, tend to be people who in, in many ways don't seem to have an awful lot of power at all um, because they're, you know, they're operating without credit cards, bank cards, um, the internet, et cetera, et cetera, which is, which is hard, but might be easier um, in certain parts of society is it easier, however, to manipulate your image when you have more power? Is it maybe about that? Um, that's, that's what I'm wondering. Um, uh, for Matthew, thank you very much. That was very, very interesting. Um, your comments on the, your biblical references made me think of an example from Australia um, that I used to use in a lecture on the anthropology of art. Um, which is really interesting and in that's quite similar. It's a group of Australian Aborigines who, who use really intricate um, paintings to portray um, 
divine power and the painting is only ever completed at the pinnacle of a ritual and is immediately destroyed. But what it has to do, the quality has to be, it has to be dazzling because in that moment, either the person on whose body it is painted or the painting itself becomes the, the beings from, the, uh, from dream time. Uh, they, are, they become present again, dream time becomes present and then immediately it has to be destroyed. Um, the article or the chapter, interestingly, is, is, on, uh, is on creativity and, and aesthetics. It's not about secrecy at all. Um, but did I understand you correctly? Then I apologize if you said that explicitly, that we see a change in the aesthetics the moment the character of, secret, of the secret changes. So then the kind of the ethical evaluation of what is secret, whether it's divine and positive or whether it's something that is potentially threatening or um, yeah, bad for the person, some kind of way, stuff and the, the aesthetic changes. Uh, and interestingly, in Tausig, um, the, the secret that is often being kept by men tends to be represented by sound rather than by anything, anything visual, although there are masks involved, but the women are supposed to see this at all. Right. Um, yeah, and with Christina, what I got really interested in, this is more of a comment than a question, what I noticed was the really negative connotation of um, the psychography in the um, language. Really, really sorry, I just need one second. <laughs> had to remove the spare laptop from the puppy, otherwise it would have been eaten. Um, so in, in the Romanian case, the really negative threatening language that, you know, there are things we need to find out in order to coerce this person and put them under pressure. And these are things that could be incredibly compromising and bad. And we know from the MFS, as the comments said, that the Stasi in East Germany also used a lot of techniques of trying to profile in a way the people they wanted to approach and find out what was the best way. But to me, it always seemed, whilst there might have been some, some threats, it also seemed to be more about attracting them and getting them involved. It's not quite, doesn't have quite this really strong threatening edge in my opinion, but I'm not the expert on that. Um, but I found that very interesting. So uh, I'll end there, thank you. So maybe you could answer the questions chronologically, <laughs> so, so Annie and then Matthew, and then maybe Christina, if you may want to say something on the last comment. Yeah, great, thank you. I think it's a really interesting question about, is it more powerful to be off the grid or are those of us who have sort of enough wealth to use spyware like Zoom or Google Chrome or smartphones um, sort of more powerful? I think it ties into what Betty and you asked at the beginning around um, what exactly does invisibility mean and how does that relate to privacy? And I think what will always come to mind for me is about um, needing to act ethically when it's not legal. So it might be that sometimes we're called on to do something because it's the just thing to do and it's not legal at the time. Um, or I remember a time when I was involved in student activism, but I was doing a postdoc. So I had a fellows apartment at a college in Cambridge, and it meant I had a front door and a back door. And the police were asking students to spy on each other. And it was really helpful that they could leave my apartment by the front door and go to the police station. And they could come in the back door or they could go out the back door. And we had guardian journalists like putting mics and cameras on them so they could countervail the police and reveal what they were doing. So I was in a position of privilege and I had this like, property that I was living in that had two had front. And we also had to put our phones in the fridge to make sure that there wasn't kind of just general data valence picking up on what we were doing. So, I mean, being in a position of privilege is quite helpful, but we weren't like off grid. You know, we used Gmail accounts in order to organize with the Guardian journalists that they would come and like fit the students with um, microphones. And I also think this sort of culture of like living off grid and getting away from the mainstream and sort of disconnecting. I've written about this in my chapter on complicity in the recent volume that I co-edited with four colleagues um, out of um, some funding we had on big data um, from Denmark. So my chapter there on complicity argues that 
this quite sort of um wealthy white able-bodied straight idea to go off grid and like go and like live in the countryside in some kind of hippie commune and queer communities or anyone who needs to access benefits obviously can't do that um, or it wouldn't be particularly safe for them to do that and um, so yeah that just um some comments about intersectionality and privilege and the use of technology being sometimes kind of un it's, it's impractical or even dangerous to unhook or to think about disconnection. And Pepita Hesselbert has um, really good work about the fantasy of disconnection or disconnectivity, as she calls it. Um, or I can't remember if it's her or me who says it's a rather sovereign gesture to kind of cut off um, and say, well, I'm just, I'm just not going to use a smartphone anymore. It's like you're going to have to be really privileged in order to get away with that. And smartphones are, of course, the first thing that people who are fleeing conflict need access to so they can contact their family or use Google Maps. I hope that's helpful response. Um, okay, thanks. Um, so uh, uh, one thing I wanted to, before I go answer Anselma's question, um, I, I, I was really fascinated with the point about the, the sort of difference between um, sort of the left and right distinction for um, thinking about uh, disappearance, uh, you know, being off the grid. Um, and just, you know, to, this has like changed quite radically in the United States, um, primarily because of Trump. I mean, everything changed in terrible ways. But this was, this was noticeable. Um, like in 20, I think it was 2015, I invited Glenn Greenwald to come to uh, the University of Utah and he gave a talk. And it was very much, I mean, the whole thing was very sort of left-leaning and um, it felt kind of radical anarchist. Um, and then now he's like, my God, like gone completely to the sort of Fox News right, um, like arch libertarian. It's been, it's a really, and I don't know, you know, I just don't know if there was like, you know, if that's a perception, you know, an aesthetic matter, or whether there's a kind of fundamental philosophical difference that he went through or and others went through. But I think that was a really fascinating observation. So thanks about that. I mean, I've been thinking about it a lot, like watching, you know, after having met him and, and heard his talk, and then to see him like transform like that, um, or maybe not transform, maybe it's just the circumstances that changed around him. I really don't know. The, but, but it's just a kind of an interesting um, an interesting point. Um, so the um, so one of the things that just to kind of speak to Anselmo's question, I would love to see that um, that that image um, that you mentioned. I think it's fast. That's that's absolutely fascinating. Um, one of the things that was that sort of led me to thinking about aesthetics was a, a larger research question um, that I've been kind of toying with for you know a decade. Well, twenty years that I've been interested in secrecy. Thirty years that I've been interested in secrecy, um, and that's. That is to think about secrecy historically, um, to think about it not as a sort of uh, permanent universal characteristic, but as something that changes historically, culturally, um, and, and can mean sort of, you know, this, the same things, the same actions can mean very different things in different cultures, different periods. And I think we can even see, you know, the difference between um, the States and Germany, um, which are you know, not all that different in lots of other ways. Um, surveillance can mean very different things. Um, I'm not expert enough to kind of go, you know, off the rails and talk about too many other cultures, but, but I kind of wanted to think about this to, to open up possibilities for scholars who are qualified to do that um, and to think about what, you know, what things would mean in a non-West, what these things would mean in non-Western contexts. Um, uh, there's, there's quite a bit of very interesting research on um, medieval secrecy that's come out in the last 10 years or so. Um, and and that's, that's some of the, part of what, what sort of spurred my interest in this was, was the way that they, uh, these scholars showed that secrecy was understood in much, much different ways um, than how we understand it. Um, and that kind of led me to, the, to think about the moment, uh, particularly in the enlightenment when secrecy changed from kind of the image of divine radiance, um, which you see throughout medieval and a lot of early modern work, um, to an image of secrecy as, as darkness. Um, and some of these scholars are, are, a lot of these scholars are very interested in the history of science 
Um, so kind of the history of science becomes the leading edge here where the divine light becomes kind of the light of reason. Um, and it's then, the, you know, therefore the, 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 the light is not something we interpret, but it's what we use to interpret the dark world around us. Um, and that then sort of um, ramifies throughout the culture in lots of different ways, it becomes associated with democratic revolutions um, where the darkness, say in so many Gothic novels is associated with the aristocracy or priestly um, power. And um, the light then becomes associated with, um, with uh, the, the people, however they're formulated. So that's really, that, that's sort of what I was, I, I was hoping came across um, to some extent was that there's lots of different paths through this, um, through this sort of, uh, when you think about it aesthetically, um, it opens up lots of different paths and gives you kind of a, a way of thinking about secrecy as a historical phenomenon, um, something that can quite change quite radically in what it means, um, how it signifies, what affects it produces, um, and what cultural functions it serves um, over time and, and in different cultures. And, and for me, the, the, the sort of striking thing was how, how that changed so radically um, in popular cultural depictions and, and artistic depictions of secrecy, you know, and write, uh, figures like Trevor Paglin, um, who, you know, adopted the, the imagery of the sublime instead of the kind of shadowy 1970s conspiracy model that you see um, that, that has become so familiar for espionage movies. I hope that answers the question. Great. Um, Christina, did you want to comment on the comment or? <laughs> Anselma, uh, thank you for your comment. Um, as, as the subject of the webinar is about secrecy, I focused on uncovering secrets as the key part of sukiography, and that's why it came out as negative, which you rightly pointed out. I love comments because they make me think about what I said. Very much appreciate that. But the concept that I sought to develop is about Sukhye as the self. So if it's about a person's vulnerability and not all vulnerabilities were seemingly bad, for example, someone's desire for ambition, for example, it could be a good thing, desire to pursue a doctorate, go abroad, things that were very difficult to attain without the assistance of the government at that time. So they were exploiting that vulnerability, which was part of one's what I call Sukhye, and as a result made them collaborate. Another person was vulnerability was someone's secret, for example, bourgeois past. But the, the concept itself does have, as you point out, a, um, an assumption that I embrace, which is it's wrongful to exploit someone's weakness. So in that way, it has a negative connotation. And I maintain my position. I don't believe it's okay to exploit someone and capitalize on something that already makes them fragile. So, uh, Anselma, thank you for, for your comment. And may, if, do we have time? I have just one question. I, um, if that's possible, if not, I will send oh, it. Yes, we do have time. Uh, to Matthew. Um, Matthew, what do you think is the opposite of a secret in light of the, the paper you have presented? Um, I don't think there's any opposite. I think, I mean, one thing that, I think that that's actually a really great question. Um, I think one of the other th the other benefits of um, thinking about secrecy as aesthetic is that you get away from a kind of binary uh, between secrecy and transparency. Yeah. Um, in a way, you know, transparency relies just as much as secrecy does as uh, just as much on secrecy as um, secrecy relies on a kind of radiance or transparency. And I think this is maybe one of the one of the you know valuable upshots of thinking through things in this way. Is that that things like you know the revelations you know whistleblowing for example mm -hmm. um, only has you know, has or gains much of its power from the fact that it it is revealing something secret. So in effect, the transparency is dependent upon the prior secrecy to have its its cultural effect. Um, mm -hmm. So you might see you know like a traditional way of thinking about it would see transparency is the opposite of secrecy or the lifting of secrecy. But in fact, see, transparency relies on the secret to have its effect, um, to, to uh, have its ethical 
weight. So right? it's a dialectical. Whistleblower. I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah. A dialectical relationship. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um, and that the whistleblower, you know, gains credibility, gains authority, gains ethical, um, ethical heft through the fact that he, he typically, but I think pointing out that it, there were a lot of women involved in this as well, and in fact, more recently too, um, in the United States, um, that they gain, they gain that kind of um, authority through their proximity to the secret uh, or former proximity to the secret. Um, so transparency in this sense relies upon, um, relies upon secrecy. And I think you can see this too. I mean, you go back to say, Jeremy Bentham, um, who was one of the most important enlightenment theoretical sort of theorizers of, of the value of publicity and transparency. And for him too, it's really about, it's about the, um, the kind of act of, of a free press in rooting out um, what's hidden by the powers that be. And so that rooting out, that action of rooting out, the, the, the sort of process of making transparent is a large part of what makes transparency powerful. Um, so this is just to kind of answer your question um, more directly. I don't think they're, I don't think these two things are opposite. I think that they're, they're on a, a continuum and that in fact, they're mutually intricated in ways that, that kind of never really ends. They, they, they sort of feed off of each other. Um, secrets gain value and power um, by the slight revelation that keeps people interested in them and gives the secret keeper um, control uh, and authority. I think you certainly see this in um, the case of the secret police um, where they need to reveal their power, reveal their sort of secret um, status, their status as being close to the secret and being in control of secrecy in order to gain, to, um, to gain power over um, those potential informers. Uh, but you also see it on the other side, where those who want to reveal secrets um, have to, you know, bank on um, their pro their former proximity to the secret as well. It works similarly with the um, position privacy in the public. Now there's a similar dynamic here, and also um, your comments also made me think of some observation that has been made in, in the last two seminars on the course uh, webinar, sorry, namely also the that secrecy um, um, is at the core of power. Canetti was quoted last week. I think it was by Vita, and I think that that already is very telling. Yes. Um, but I would like to, can you all, I would like to draw your attention to the, the few questions in the chat box, I think, at one at four, five past four by Mark. Um, Christina, I think you have answered this question, um, but if you wanted to, to add something more, because we haven't addressed it explicitly, it's in the chat box. I can also read it out again. How far does Psuche differ from the usual espionage focus on exploiting vulnerabilities in relation to money, ideology, coercion, ego? It encompasses all of it because it targets, it, it says it's a person that is vulnerable. It, it sends the message that every person is vulnerable in something, <laughs> money, ego, ambition, and so forth. It, it, it just encompasses everything. Because we all, it depends, it varies. What makes you vulnerable make, doesn't make me vulnerable and vice versa. But in the end, we can both be affected by the idea of being targeted where it hurts. Okay, I hope Mark, you're happy with this answer. Um, <laughs> this is, <laughs> and there's another question here uh, um, addressed um, to Annie. Um, uh, can you see this question, Annie? It's also five plus four. NSDA P member of to his Stuttgart newspaper, an effective means to curb false pity and false feelings of humanity is my habit of long standing, not even to see the Jew, to see right through him as if he were made of glass, or rather as if he were thin air, fritsche life and death in the Third Reich. So how different is the way we blend out unpleasant social realities? Yeah, thank you. I really appreciate that comment. I suppose um it was provoked by the bits in Stiles' film about actually being invisible can be deadly, and some people 
were kept in invisible or secret prisons and tortured and that's the kind of invisibility we wouldn't want um anybody to be vulnerable to i really appreciate it and i've made a note of it and it actually um links to some work i'm doing about the poetry of the east german poet wolfgang hilbig about empathy and how do you look at other people and whether empathy is a depth phenomenon sort of seeing the humanity of the other person or whether it's more about surface and you know literally just looking at um looking at the other person um visually it's, and the article is kind of about the um the disagreement between Heidegger and Arendt about what exactly empathy consists in, how much it's to do with just a um, sort of a creation of a surrogate self in looking visually at the other person. And um, yeah, so that's that was really, really helpful. And um, thank you for, for mentioning that. And I'm really interested in what Vita says then later about der Gläserner Mensch, the, yeah. glass, the glass person also being, I presume this is a West German controversy that I'm not that in touch with in my East German and post-1989 interest, but that, that was really great. Just reminds me of Christa Wolf, um, the East German writer's controversial short story, Vast Lives, and she describes the Stasi officers sitting outside her flat, or the narrator's flat, as gläsern. They have a, have a gläserner blick, a glassy gaze, and I was always very confused about who's glassy here? Is it the person under surveillance? And does that mean they're transparent and you can see us? Or is it the kind of glassy, um, look of the Stasi operative who's not showing anything about themselves it's just like a reflective surface and probably this is I mean it's a problematic metaphor isn't it because glass has different effects depending on what time of day and whether there's any electric lights on and like a glass building is completely transparent in the night time but in the daytime when presumably most bankers etc are doing their most evil acts you can't see anything because you know, it's just reflective and all we see on the glass transparent glass banking buildings are, are ourselves mirrored back so I've always been really troubled by the idea of a Gläserner Mensch in, in German. I've, I've never really understood what that means. Does that mean transparent or does it mean, does it mean completely opaque? I think in the surveillance discourse, like if you also look at Angriff auf die Freiheit by Juli C. and Trojanov, what they actually mean is this kind of really some, some kind of flat people where you can, it's just transparency. I think that's the the, the, in these kinds of discourses. But I think you are right in uh, highlighting that the, it can't be usually actually taken for granted. I, I do agree. So I'm, um, I think the rest of the questions were oh, I mean, more comments than questions. So, so um, no, are there any other questions which would like to be raised? And I'm just trying to see if there I can if I have missed out on any other questions, there have been many comments. <laughs> kind of, um... Oh no, there's a question to Matthew here. Your work made me think of th this huge sculpture outside the HQ of the BND in Berlin. Possibly this is already in your book. So there's a link, which, so yes. Um, would you like to comment oh, on yeah. that? Yeah, I looked at it. Um, thank you, Peter, for pointing that out. It's not in my book, actually. I'm mostly focusing on American culture and in the book. Um, but that's that's fa that's really fascinating because I mean, a lot of the a lot of the imagery of kind of size um, has to do with you know that you may have seen um, images, say, of of the uh, National Security Agency, of the NSA buildings, and they're they're always they're it's always photographed to suggest it's just massive bureaucratic ginormousness. Um, so, you know, largeness is, is kind of has, has a sort of signifying power, but it, it um, but in that case, it's kind of like the, the signifying power is, has to do with the, the sort of awe of the person um, or the awe that they're trying to create um, from the, from, from the, the size of the national security bureaucracy. Um, so, for example, there's down just about 20 miles, 15 miles south of me, there's a giant NSA. Um, basically, it's like an enormous hard drive, uh, which could hold more information than exists in the universe right now. Um, and it's, it's all just there. It's, it's like right out in the open. And um, Trevor Paglin, uh, who I also had out here, um, that's part of the same lecture series where I had Glenn Greenwald, um, he, he's worked in, in Utah quite a bit because there's a lot of weapons um, depots and, 
uh, weapons testing sites that he's he's photographed. And he did photographs of that Utah uh, NSA thing. And, and again, it's always presented to like suggest the massiveness of it, you know, just how big everything is. Uh, but what's interesting about the German one is that, that there it's the security service saying we're big um, or showing bigness. Um, usually what's, what's kind of interesting about these is that the security services are trying to efface themselves, um, that the this, this sublime comes from the absence of information, but here they, they're sort of outwardly saying, yes, we're huge uh, and we have lots of information more than you will ever know. Um, and, you know, therefore you should be terrified or awed or, um, you know, or, or somehow in, uh, you know, feeling admiration for us. Um, so that, that, that's what seems kind of quite interesting to me about that. Great, thank you. I think we should probably come to a close now. Uh, although questions are not exhausted, I still have many. It's a very rich topic and that's good. So it makes us kind of um, think further about these very interesting topics. Um, Anselma, now um, maybe you want to say something about the next webinar? Um, okay, thank you. So thank you very much for, for all of the speakers today. It's been great and for everybody contributing to the discussion and the very rich um, stream of um, comments, questions um, and suggestions in the chat as well. So our last webinar in the series will be taking place this Friday, um, I think at the same time as no, on Wednesday, that's right, <laughs> at the same time as, as this session today, um, and we'll be focusing on methodological and epistemological challenges, um, and the very first webinar, you know, the, there was a methodological question being raised in one of the, um, one of the papers, you know, how do you study secrecy? But again, as we've heard today, plenty that if there's secrecy, there's knowledge, there's always revelation where there's concealment. So but I'm sure that those are the questions that we'll be, we'll be returning to again and again um, on Wednesday. And I hope to see many of you join us again and continue our conversation. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. That was brilliant. Thanks everyone, see you soon, bye. Thanks everyone, bye.